<laughs> okay, so uh, let's uh, uh, let's start. Uh, speaking us today is uh, Matt Walter, who's been uh, a faculty working in robotics for six years, five years, five, five, Single digit number that's higher than five. Uh, and yeah, uh, so I got that five-year trophy thing. Yeah, I saw your five years, so at least five. So I've been. Um, uh, so we saw lots of events in robotics recently, and like you know, uh, uh, working with uh, you know waiters and restaurants and self-driving. I don't know what I really want is a robot that will do my dishes and my laundry. But at least what we'll hear about today is you don't have to play video games anymore. Robots can play yes. video games for you. It's a, it's a gimmick of one, time. One burden at least off your hands. So. Actually, the very little video games. <laughs> Like I was saying, I don't even know it's grammatically correct. But, uh, yeah, so thanks for coming, especially since it's about zero degrees Fahrenheit outside. For those of you who walk, this does not work. For those of us who use Fahrenheit. Yes. <laughs> uh, maybe now. Okay, nope, that doesn't work either. Maybe you need the robot. It's the USB of the There we go. Okay, so really what I'm going to focus much of the talk on is automation, particularly automation in unstructured or semi-structured environments. So, as Nadi said, there's been a lot of advancements in, in robotics today, but most of the robots we see that are fielded, if they're doing anything, doing anything autonomous, it's in highly prepared environments. So this is, a, you know, many of you have probably seen this many times, but this is a t Tesla Model S factory, obviously sped up, where you have robot arms assembling a car. And really, that's one of the big successes, and we've had that for decades and decades. But it's a very highly structured environment. The robot is, it, we have very precise control of the robot, very accurate encoders, so we know what the joint angles are. We know where all the objects are that are being picked up. There are no humans around, so these walls keep humans outside away from the robots because they are very dangerous. And it's a very controlled environment, so really, as I said, autonomy in the presence of uncertainty. Of certainty. But what happens now if you want to take these robots and take them out of the lab or out of factory floors and you want to use, use them in unprepared environments or unstructured environments, um, say for example underwater. So you have an underwater manipulator here which has a, a thing called a slurp gun, which is basically a vacuum cleaner underwater that's going to suck up water, that hose there. Or it might, and it might also you have a manip end effector, so you might want to grasp something. You have a bomb disposal robot uh, that's going to inspect, the, inspect uh, this box to see what's inside. Again, these are unstructured or semi-structured environments, not at all prepared a priori. And so what you end up doing is you end up teleoperating these robots. So basically just using a joystick or many joysticks, watching one or more camera feeds to figure out where the robot is, and you try to infer where the end effector should be to perform a task and then control the joints, solve the inverse kinematics to do this. And it's a very involved process. It takes a lot, a lot of training. So we see when robots are you know, faced with uncertainty, typically what we'll do, at least in the field, is we'll just basically turn them into glorified RC cars. Okay. So motivating a lot of this, uh, motivating this work is, again, this, this objective of NASA, and again, I think some of you have seen this before, is to search, search for extraterrestrial life in some of the moons of, of Saturn and Jupiter. Um, so Enceladus and Europa. And they believe that these moons are covered by an ice sheet, and they believe that there's an ocean, or there's water underneath. And they believe, you know, the people hypothesize that at the crust of each one of these moons, the seafloor, there are hydrothermal vents and maybe early forms of life. So the, and NASA has a long-term plan to send robots to these planets, or these moons, rather, to search for extraterrestrial, extraterrestrial life. Uh, again, that's many, many years out, but certainly you can imagine that teleoperation is not a viable mode of operation in these settings just because of the significant latency, ridiculously significant latency in the bandwidth constraints. Okay, but again, we're, we, I, we can't send a robot to Jupiter or Mars, or sorry, Jupiter or uh, this moon of, of Saturn right now, but what we can do is we can perform variations of this on, let's see, one more. Yeah, so this is the rendering of what you might imagine, potentially. Um, well, we can do this on Earth. So we, this was a couple years ago now. We participated in this research cruise. You know, cruise is not, not in the maybe sense of word you're used to, um, off, of, off of Greece. So there's an underwater volcano um, that has this large caldera, or this Colombo is the, is the site. And it erupted in about 1650 AD, sending flows uh, hundreds of miles, hundreds of kilometers, killing, was it, 70 people. 
And so you have this caldera, which is what's left of the eruption. That's about a mile, a kilometer and a half in diameter. Depth anywhere at the top. So the seafloor is here. Here's the top of, imagine, just this big bowl, basically. is 20 meters, anyway, anywhere down to 500 meters. So it's a nice, this, and there are many other sites like this, nice uh, testing locations that, again, also have hydrothermal venting sites and potentially involve communications over with limited bandwidth and large latency. And so we took part in a cruise that was this. So here's a picture of the caldera here. So again, about a, mile, a kilometer and a half in diameter. This is about two, 20 meters deep from the, from the sea surface and then about 500 or so meters deep. So 1,700 feet from. And though there are hydrothermal vents here. So this is video from, uh, that we recorded with one of the vehicles there. These are venting sites here. And with, with these vents, with the minerals that get released, you have, you have bacterial growth. And again, that's one of the things they might want to see on Encephalus uh, or other moons of Saturn and Jupiter. And so this is one of these bacterial mats that scientists would like to sample. Okay, so we went there with this vehicle that is called Nui, so near and under the ice. It's a pretty awesome vehicle. It's a hybrid ROV, so remotely operated vehicle. Think again, glorified RC car underwater, and AUV, autonomous underwater vehicle. It's designed, most ROVs are tethered, so you have people on a ship looking at video screens, controlling this robot, they're connected through this uh, maybe two, three centimeter diameter cable that has power and data, fiber optic cable. This vehicle instead just has a very thin fiber optic cable, about as thin as a hair, your hair. No power, as you can imagine, but does have gigabit ethernet, gigabit data, and it's 40 kilometers long. So that means that this vehicle that is designed to go under ice sheets, they can send it out laterally from a ship up, upwards of 40 kilometers via this tether. It's a, it's a pretty, tether fits in a coffee can. It's pretty amazing to see this vehicle. Uh, and, okay, no external power, so it carries everything on board. And what it has is at the front, these, like, these doors that open up. It's on the sea floor. And you have a stereo camera, a fisheye camera. You have a robot arm, so hydraulic arm, with another camera on the on the end effector. Here's this slurp gun, this vacuum cleaner, in effect. Um, you have a tool sled here, so it's going to carry various tools with it that it can use to sample. And then you'll deploy this off of a surface vessel like this. Again, you can see this tether that I'm labeling there. And again, it's 40 kilometers long. And it will break. It's designed to break at the end of every mission, so that's, again, it gives rise to the autonomy. It has to, at the very least, return to the ship autonomously. But it can do much more than that. Anyway, so that's what we were working with. We had another cruise last year off of LA. Now, the problem with this is that ROV operations are very expensive. So they require a ship. Ship is upwards of 50000 a day. Icebreakers are over $100,000 a day. Uh, they have limited berthing space. So running these things requires a dozen crew members, highly trained crew, crew members. They have to be on the ship. That limits the space for scientists. And training, becoming proficient as a, as a crew, requires months just to become, develop basic proficiency and years, really, to become proficient at, at, at a task. Um, again, just even if you're just doing teleoperation. So we have a, a user study that was just conducted at HUI, where we took an interface that we've developed and gave it to pilots. So these are trained months, years, pilots that are controlling these ROVs or manned Elvin, if you've heard of Elvin. And we looked at, had them perform a variety of tasks using a standard teleoperation interface and looked at how successful they were. So whether they were able to complete the task, whether the task failed, whether, the, whether there was a crash, like a collision with the ground, or a timeout. And you know, not surprisingly, they're pretty effective. They're about, you know, what is it, about 75% of the time they completed the task. Now, if we wanted to take a, a scientist who's not highly trained to interact with these vehicles, you know, they're far less successful. Again, these are pretty easy tasks. They get about 60%, and about, what, 30% of the time they're crashing, running it into the vehicle, into the seafloor. And that's dangerous for manned vehicles because you have a manned Elvin goes down to 6,500 meters, that has three people inside, and if the arm hits one of the, one of the windows, it could rupture killing people. So it's, it, you don't want collisions. You don't want crashes. Anyway, so we developed this interface that allows us to distribute uh, control, not on the ship, but uh, uh, throughout the world, really. So we ran a, a test in California where we had, the vehicle was off of LA, Canalina Island, about a thousand meters deep. 
uh, connected either via tether or there's an optical modem, basically just using light to communicate. We had someone here in the lab, it was Andrea. We had someone in, in Woods Hole. Where is Woods Hole? Woods Hole is somewhere here. Not here. Woods Hole. And then someone in Cambridge. So three scientists interacting with this vehicle when it was about 1,000 meters down. And we had this XRF, X-ray fluorimeter, which someone from Woods Hole was controlling in real time to collect data on the seafloor, just basically doing elemental analysis. And again, get the, gets the data back, is able to process it, and then identifies a, a location to sample. Gave that to someone in Cambridge who is controlling this interface. Again, and because this is over satellite, so there's limited, very limited bandwidth and high latency. So teleoperation is either impossible or at the very least impractical for these settings. Okay, so what the focus of this talk is on how we might enable this by sort of living somewhere in between full teleoperation, RC cars, and full autonomy, which in this in these re regimes is not possible. We don't the environments are so unstructured, the autonomy capabilities that we have are not yet ready for full autonomous intervention, so manipulation. So we need to be somewhere in between. And so one solution for that is what's referred to as shared autonomy or shared control. And as the name suggests, the idea with shared control or shared autonomy is that you have two agents that are controlling this physical robot. One is a human, and the other is some, uh, some uh, AI or some, some agent right? That, uh, uh, that's controlling this manipulator. So a lot of this is motivated by uh, assistive technology, so helping people with, li with limited mobility, li limited motor skills. So in this example, which I think is from Sinsri Navasa, the, the idea is you have this robot, and the person would like the robot to pick up an object on the table. But the person cannot do it themselves, maybe can't or don't want to teleoperate the robot's arm, but instead they provide some indication of their intent, of their goal. And the idea is this agent then once it infers the user's goal, can go out and carry out the task, pick up the object. Right. That's the high level. Of the so if there are any questions, feel free to interrupt me. Um, and so the goal really is to try to take advantage of things that are, might be easy for a robot to do, like path planning, avoiding collisions, solving inverse kinematics. So if I want to get the end effector here, what should my shoulder angle be, my elbow angle, etc.? That's easy for robots, but not easy for people. But scene understanding... Um, Breaking down a task into, into modular goals is easy for people. That's the, the basic gist is to, to, to take advantage of these, the complementary skill set between humans and robots. And this, this is not new. There's been a lot of work in this area, you know, dating back I have 90s there, but it's well before then, I think 60s or 70s at least. Um, and most of the work that, it, most of people that are earlier work in this area assume that I know what the user's goal is. The user can hit a button and say, my goal is to pick up the red cup. And at that point, it just becomes a path planning and manipulation task. So autonomy is relatively easy. More recent me methods then don't assume that the goal is known, but they assume the space of goals. Goals are known. So I know I'll assume that I know that I want the user. The user wants me or the robot to pick up one of these three objects. I don't know which object, so I'll try to figure that out based upon um, the, uh, some signal that the user is providing. And I, in the previous slide, I showed the various. Interfaces. It could be a joystick. It could be something that you wear in your head, etc. Um, I'll try to infer their goal from that. And then more recent work, including some of the stuff that Chip did and, and what we're, we're working on deadline today, is trying to do this where the goal space is not not discrete and is not known at all a priori. So that's the focus. And so I'll just give a little brief formulation to this problem. So typically, what we're going to do is we're going to formulate this in, in, as some MDP some variant of an MDP, so a markup decision process. So we have some representation of the state space. This could be the joint angles of the arm, the location of objects in the environment. Some settings it may be continuous, others it may be discrete, or some mixture thereof. We have some action that the robot can execute. The environment has some process model. So if the state, if you're in some state S and the robot executes some action A, we want a distribution over the subsequent state. The user has some input. This might be a joystick. Uh, they have some goal, goal space G, which again may or may not be known a priori. And the user has some policy you know, based on that maps the state and the goal to a uh, joystick action. So if the object's over the area here, over the left, they might imagine pushing the joystick to the left to steer the arm over there. And they have some reward function. And so typically, though, we're going to assume that maybe goals are known, but we don't know what the user's policy is, and we don't know what their reward function is. So 
one natural way of figuring this out might be to use inverse reinforcement learning. So we take a collection of demonstrations, and then from these demonstrations, we're going to we're going to solve for the corresponding reward and policy that are consistent with these demonstrations. So there's max and inverse reinforcement learning uh, Brian, by Brian Sieber. Okay, but again, underlying this is going to be this MVP formulation, where our goal is to Again, there's some user reward. It may or may not be known. We want to solve for the policy. This is, again, the policy of the assistant that can maximize the long-term sum of discounted rewards. That's going to be our objective. And when things are an MDP, meaning that we know the transitions and we know the reward function, this is a pretty easy problem. Um, it just basically amounts to dynamic programming to solve for the corresponding policy. And that's basically how this would be done. So the earlier work that assumed that you know the goal is known, the reward is known, could but the environment is stochastic, would formulate this as an MDP. And again, it's it's pretty straightforward. So again, you're going to solve for the value, oops, you're going to solve for the value function, and then from the value function, you're going to infer the resulting policy. And again, I'll, I'll go. To, I'll just speed over this pretty quickly. We cover it's just the very basics. Um, I'm talking about in the robotics class. Um, so basically, you're going to solve one of the ideas you solve for the value function <coughs> from the value fu or the state value function, Q or V, and then from that you can recover the optimal policy. So now, what if the goal is not known? Right? We know the space of possible goals. There are three objects on the table, but I don't know which object the user wants to pick up. How might you formulate this? Well, again, we'll, we'll think of this as an MDP where the state space now is going to include not just the state of the robot and objects in the environment, but also the goal. So if I observe, if I had a full, observ full observability, that means that not only do I know where the objects are and where the robot is, but I also know where the, which, which I know what the user's goal is. But we don't know that. So it's like an MDP, but with partially, a partially observable state. We might know that we know the transitions, maybe the process model. We might know the reward given the goal, but we don't know the state. So what that gives rise to is what's referred to as a partially observable Markov decision process, which is very very similar to an MDP, but um, far more intractable and something that you want to avoid if at all possible. Oh, what is U? U. U is, where is U? Ah, uh, U is the user's input action. Yeah, so the idea is I have some observation function. It might be an image, it might be a depth camera, but I also have the joystick inputs from the user. And the idea is that from these observations of the state, whether it's again camera and joystick input, I want to try to estimate the, the latent state, what is not known. Again, in this example, the most, important, the most important being the goal, the user specific goal, based on where they're moving the joystick. You can imagine, like I said, if they're moving it to the left, that's, a, that's indicative that their goal is on the left. So this, this little cartoon is showing that. You know, there are two objects in the scene. The user has one object in mind. The agent doesn't know which object. So it's hypothesizing that you know, either the user wants the one on the right or the one on the left is going to maintain some probability distribution over the goals and update that distribution as it gets more input, more joystick input, say, for example. Yeah. Ben. Are we assuming that with the unknown goal, that the goal is constant? And that we just don't know it, or can it vary over time? Yeah, so when here, here we're assuming it's constant okay. yeah, over an episode. And that the goal space is known. I know yeah. how, what, what, the, what, goal, what could be a goal. And so the way that you'll do this is, again, as I mentioned before, you're going to maintain a distribution over the state space conditioned on the observation. So this B of S is really probability of S given the observation history. Right? So over time, the more observations you get, that's giving you a better estimate of the state. And so that's referred to as a belief state. And we're going to, again, update this via prediction step. It's very, it's very similar to filtering if you've taken a robotics class. And there's going to be an update step, which, again, is very similar to the update step, say, in, in Kalman filtering or Bayesian filtering more generally. And now what you can do with the POMDP is you can take a POMDP and you can effectively turn it into an MDP. So an MDP, again, you want a policy that takes as input your state and spits out the optimal action for that state. Now what we're going to do is we're going to take our belief, B of S. We're going to treat our belief, B of S, as a state. And so now our policy is going to be a function that maps our belief state to an action. So turning a POMDP effectively into an MDP. Um, but it is far more difficult, so why is that? Um, 
One is, again, whereas you might have a state that's you know, fairly low dimensional, again, it's typically this is not done over images, it's, you know, uh, you know the pose of the robot and objects in the environment. Now, the state is a probability distribution, so it's a continuous probability distribution. Um, so now we need to, when we're estimating the value function, we didn't need to do, the, do that for every action in every possible probability distribution. If I pick in, that's problematic because probability distributions are continuous in, in these settings. And the belief space is set, it, it, itself is not just continuous, but it tends to be fairly complex. So that caused, you know, Pomni bees are, like I said before, if you can, if you can avoid them like the, the plague. So instead, what we, what we did, and again, we're not the first to do this, uh, Anka and uh, uh, Dragon and, and Sergey Levin and Sid Reddy had a paper uh, the year before us, but different, um, that formulates this not as a POM BP, but really formulates shared autonomy as an RL problem. So we have the same cartoon diagram here where you have the user providing some input, might be joystick commands. We have the robot that again has some markup process with some state, and then the agent is taking in, as before, the user's input and then is inferring what action to execute for the robot to achieve some reward. But again, this is an RL problem. So <coughs> we don't know the reward, and we don't know the transition function. The best we can do is, have, is interact with the environment, execute an action, see what the next state is, see what reward we get, and then use that as a signal to learn. So that's the basic gist. Um, and again, I'll skip over this. So what we wanted to do now, what, one problem with, with this is that we want to be able to do this again because we don't know the model. I have, I, one approach is to est first estimate it. So I can interact with the environment. In, I'm in some state S. I apply some action, and the environment transitions me to a new state. I can collect these triplets, so state, action, state, S, T, A, T, S, T plus 1. And from them, I can estimate a Markov. Okay. And then similarly, what I can do is I can take my state, action, and then the corresponding reward that the environment gives me by interacting, and I can collect all this data in a buffer, and I can estimate my reward function. And then with that, what I can effectively do is take, um, turn this into an MDP. Now, because I have an estimate of the reward and an estimate of the transition or the process model, so this becomes an MDP now, and I know how to solve that, just like a dynamic programming. But there are issues with that because... It, the estimate of the transition function is exactly that. It's an estimate. It's not going to be correct. Although it's the same with the reward. And so as a result, but I'm going to treat it as being correct. So when I get a policy, that policy is most often not going to be optimal in the actual environment. And it may involve, it require a significant number of iterations. So that's a, that's a model-based method. So instead, what we were looking at is doing this in a model-free, off-policy way. So for, for efficiency reasons. And the way that we do this is we do this via Q learning. So we learn that state action function. Um, yeah. So for your setting, how do you define the rewards? Like, are they related to the goals at all? Yeah, so that's a good question. So what in this setting, actually, what we explicitly want with this is to do this in a task lark. Okay, so I, we, we, call it, we call it task agnostic. It's not quite task agnostic. We want to do this without, with very little, if any, knowledge of the reward. So we don't know what the user's task. So again, we don't know the goal space at all. So we don't know what the task involves. But we assume we know we have some very vague notion of the task in the sense that I'll show this for a drone flying test. Crashing is bad. So we don't want to crash. I don't know if the user wants to land or they want to fly to a particular goal. I don't know what they want to do or just float around. I just know that crashing is bad. So we formulate, we have a reward that formulates the cost of crash or negative cost of crash. So the, yeah, so the previous paper by you know Anka and, and, and Sid and Sergey had explicit reward feedback. So it's very task dependent. We were looking at the same. Can we do this in a model-free, largely task agnostic way? So I guess like an example of the I mean, the other paper you mentioned is like if you want the robot blah 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 from A to B, like you have you explicitly just like compute the reward as like you know some L two distance of the actual the deviation from the path. Yeah, so I might, or I might, I might not explicitly calculate. I might get that from the environment. Okay. okay. So in, in that case, what they did, I mean, they didn't really do this in, in practice, but they had a user with a button, two buttons, I think, you know, good, bad. So that's how they. So the robot would execute an action with their shared autonomy system. They would push, 
the good button, if it was good, the bad, I guess sort of like if you go through TSA, there's this kiosk that says, you know, frowny face up to a smiley face, and you hit the button, sort of like that. Right. They would hit the one based on their experience. Now, that's such limited feedback that they actually didn't do this for their for training their model. Um, but they, anyway, they assume that they get some sparse or sparse feedback from the user or a surrogate user. For us, we didn't get any feedback from the user. So, so this is how we get it. It's a pretty simple update. We're maintaining this state action function. This is Q that says for you know a candidate, or sorry, sorry, it says if you're in some state S and you execute action A, which might be from any policy, what are you? What is my expected long-term reward under under, the, under a corresponding policy? That's what we do. And so now we estimate our Q function. So this is Q learning for a shared autonomy. Again, our observations are might be an image or the pose of the robot, and then the user's joystick actions. And we want to learn a policy. So the policy that's going to take the state, the user's joystick actions and then is going to provide a distribution over the actions. And this is going to be a delta function where we're hard maxing over Q. So question. Yep. So the idea here is that given a state and given some action taken by the user to optimize for the goal in question, we want to figure out for the shared autonomous agent like that's helping, like what action would be best? Is that yeah, we, so we don't know what the goal is, and we don't even know what the space of goal is. We just want to think, what's the best thing I can do? Um, what, what, what thing? Can I do that's in the best interest of the user based on what I know? Um, and so this is how we, this is again our, our model. But again, we want to do this, people have done this various thing, related things for discrete state and action spaces. But we wanted to do this for continuous action spaces. And so we have a, an architecture that takes as input, um, again, here's our environment or our robot. The environment returns some state. We take that state and we're going to we're going to augment it with the user's joystick input. So that augmented state, which is concatenating it basically, is going to be fed to some pretty simple neural network. And that neural network is going to output a policy. We're going to sample from that policy and we're going to get an action. Pretty straightforward. Yeah. Uh, the previous slide there was some function f. What is that? F is something. F is some. Uh, what is f? Um, <coughs> Similarity. Similarity. Does it say here? Okay. Yes. Well, it's in the. It, it's text. yes. Okay. So yeah. So what what this was? Okay. So I didn't. I glossed over this. Um, so one issue with shared autonomy is again, you don't. You may even if you could, you might not necessarily want to turn this dial towards full autonomy. You want to give the user some notion, some um, notion of control authority. And people, have, there have been a bunch of user studies where they've done this with people in assistive technology settings, so controlling the wheelchair, where they don't like it when the wheelchair takes com takes over completely, and they feel like they have no sense of control. Um, and so, what this formulation is saying is that what we want to do is we have the action that our policy outputs. Okay, there's the action that the user indicated, and we want to maintain their similarity. We want, to do the, we want to pick the action that's most similar to what the human suggested, subject to some optimality constraints. So this is the ready paper thing. Um, so basically, yeah, so they're basically, yeah, so this is, A star is like the best thing that the agent could do. And as long as I'm within, you know, you know as long as I'm close to this, I'm happy doing something that's consistent with what the user wanted. Yeah. Is there a relationship between this and the knowledge distillation in student teacher learning? Well, you are basically, you have some agent which you assume knows how to do it well, mm -hmm. which would be like the teacher network, mm -hmm. and you are trying to train another model which will try to trade off between trying to mimic what the teacher does and its own constraints. And that's maybe where the similarity yeah. ends, but... But, but typically, don't they? You know, are they happy if they perfectly do what the expert yeah. larger network does? Um, so you're thinking of the, t the teacher here as the human? Yeah. Okay. yeah. So that, that's sort of flipped because it, here no, the human is no, suboptimal. No, the user is suboptimal. The user is suboptimal. So the user could be thought of as the student. I think, no, no, no. So, so the student network can end up being better than the teacher network. It does happen. In fact, that was 
thermos in the original night dissertation paper that happened. I see. Um, the, the, the tricky part is there you are trying to mimic the distribution, the posterior with some temperature of the teacher. Here you don't have that, you just have a sample. Mm -hmm. Maybe that complicates this, but okay. So we, we don't. It's a distraction. We can move on. Yeah, we can talk about it later. So this is how we were doing it. Let's check the time. But I'm a bit yeah confused. So here, up until now, so this is the first time where it seems that A and A H have to be kind of in the same space to some extent. Yeah. So I sort of I glossed over that before. Um, so, in okay. So really, what this would be? Let me go back to F. F is just some function. Here, they don't have to be in the same space. This is some function. This could take U, as I was indicating before, yeah. and at some action A. This, you could be three-dimensional, joystick commands, um, twist, and and this could be sixed off, whatever yeah. that it is for the robot, different angles. And this is just some function that tries to infer their similarity, measures the similarity. The function learn this part of the whole thing? In this case, no, this function is defined in their work. So I guess it should be also state dependent, perhaps. Because it might be, yeah. Okay. So that's how people again. That's how that's how Ready did it. But they get you know reward feedback from the user, and so we wanted to do is see well can we mod can we mod is there a better way that we can model this problem um, again for continuous action spaces? And so for that, we took inspiration from. Residual policy learning. So res residual policy learning is a pretty simple idea, and I think, you know, pretty interesting one, where you assume you have some base class or some baseline policy or function. But in this case, it's a it's a control policy. If you're familiar with um, linear control, this could be a, this could be an LQR based controller, so some model based controller. So imagine you wanted you have some you know, difficult control task. You can assume you have maybe some initial. You can assume some estimated model of the dynamics, a simplified, in this case maybe a linear model of the dynamics, and I might know the objective. What I could do is I can use LQR to solve for a corresponding policy for that that's optimal get for that linear model and that cost function. I'm going to go execute that on the robot, and it's not going to work because the dynamics aren't linear, and that objective maybe isn't, isn't really the objective that I care about. So what you might imagine doing is taking that action that I got from my baseline controller and learning to correct it. So the idea is that this LQR controller gets me almost all the way there, or at least gets me towards the right action, but I'm, there's a gap still. Can I learn some residual term that corrects this gap, that improves behavior? Um, so that, that's the basic idea um, for residual policy learning, and there's been some you know, very interesting work uh, in the last couple of years, at least that I'm aware of in the robotics area, that's that's used this to sort of speed up policy learning. I mean, there could be, it might also not speed things up. You can imagine maybe an adversarial setting where your base controller is actually um, hurting you, making it more difficult to learn the task, or forces you into a, 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 a poor optimum. Local optimum. Okay, so. Uh, da -da -da -da. So now we're thinking of, can we actually do this in the context of RL? So we might learn some, you know, can we learn a baseline, again, formulate this uh, residual term as a corrective policy that maximizes expected long-term future rewards. And that's the basic gist of how we're going to module, we're going to formulate shared autonomy. So our goal is to, again, have you, the user is going to play the role of this baseline controller. They're providing some input. We're assuming that they're not horrible at the task. They're not pushing us in the wrong direction. Their actions provide some reasonable zeroth order approximation to a, a good action. And what we want to do is then we want to correct this. So we're going to replace this user-defined controller. Again, for us, it's now going to be a human input. And we're going to augment it. We're going to have some policy that's going to take in their joystick commands it's going to, and the state, and it's going to figure out how it should correct their actions to perform well at the, the task. Really, for us, we don't know what the task is. We're going to do this just to avoid um, crashing, basically. I'll make that a little more clear. Any questions? Maybe so. Um, 
So we could formulate this again, it'd be pretty trivial, to formulate this as a, as a problem of maximize long-term expected reward. Um, but at the same time, as I mentioned before, there's this notion of not wanting to deviate too much from the user's intent, be faithful to what the user wanted to do. Okay, so one, re one way I could do that is I could say, well, my objective is to, if I knew the reward function, or I get it from interacting with the environment, I can maximize my long-term sum of rewards, discounted rewards, but then I'll have some residual term, some penalty, that's going to encourage me to encourage the residuals to be small. Might be reasonable. Um, we, we played with this a bit, but it, it's very sensitive to your choice of lambda, this, this scaling on this residual term. So it's subject to this penalty. So instead, what we do is we borrow one of you. If any of you were at David Held's talk several weeks ago, he didn't discuss this, but when he was a postdoc, he had this you know, nice paper on constrained markup decision processes. And that's the way that we're going to formulate it, not using his exact method. But we're going to assume we now we have an MDP, but we have some constraints on the policy that gets executed. So we have some M constraints here, where these constraints are a function of the state and the actions. And what we in practice, what we're going to do is these constraints are going to be constraints on the reward. So again, if it crashes, it's a large and magnitude negative reward, and we want to make sure that that or that is not that constraint is not violated. Okay. And so what we can do is now for each constraint, we can look at the expected discounted cost under this under each for each constraint ci. And now what we want to do is we want to consider some set of policy classes, a policy class rather where it's a set of valid policies subject such that these constraints are satisfied. This is from RSS 2020 paper. So a set of policies that satisfy these constraints. And that's the way that we formulate this. So in particular, what we do is we want to minimize the extent of our residual action. So that now becomes our objective, not a constraint. Minimize the set minimize the, our, the corrective actions such that some, again, not task agnostic, but large, you know, very in, not very task dependent constraint is satisfied. Again, this is like, don't, you know, if it's a drone flying task, we don't want to crash. And that's our objective. Um, very simple, simple. And so again, this is a little Victoria, this is our picture, this is what we have. Minimize the residual term subjects to this, you know, general, quote-unquote, general uh, constraint on reward. Okay? And so we do this for a variety of typical but simulated control tasks. So we take our baseline policy and we train it via uh, PPO. And the way that we did this was we would actually we had people play this game. So again, in, or in order to train this, we have this co-pilot. And this co-pilot needs to be aware of how people might fly when it interacts, when, when it plays the game with them. So we had people, uh, I think it was just a couple people play this game, and then we trained a policy based upon these demonstrations, and that, be, that becomes our surrogate human, our surrogate human. And so we use that, and we trained, um, and we use that to train our assistant, and then we evaluate its effectiveness on a variety of other surrogate humans. So what we did is we took, and uh, we took, you know, PPO, Learned a policy that you know, learned a policy for this lunar landing test. So if you're not familiar with this task, you have these two flags that they indicate the goal where you're supposed to land. Between episodes, they're in different locations. The goal is the vehicle starts up some random position with some random velocity, and you want to land between the flags before time expires. If you go off screen, it's considered a crash, and if you hit the ground, it's considered a crash. And so we trained a policy to so, do this. And you, you see the flags? Like the, the robot? The, yeah, the robot, the, it's the, no. The yeah. AI sees the yes, flags. Yes, AI sees the flags. Yeah. So it could do it on its own then? It could, it could do it on, yeah. So the baseline policy, but our assistant doesn't know that this is the task. We take the same assistant in this task and in this task. So in this task, oh, the goal is to fly to this circle, this reaching task. Oh, so the task. training was not just with the flags? No. Much different no, context. yeah. Okay. So the goal here is not landing. You want to fly here. Um, in both of these, they have this constraint that you don't want to crash. And so we have that. Um, so yes, yeah, this is Lunar, lunar Reacher, and then we have this drone task, where it's a six DOF control test. You can imagine this is a cartoon drone, quad rotor. And the goal is to fly into this sphere before time expires and not crash. Okay. And so the way that we did this is we tested this with different P 
people, quote unquote people, in practice, well, we did this with people, but we also did this with surrogate pilots. So pilot is, you're the pilot, this assistant is the co-pilot, and we have surrogate pilots. And the way that we did that is we took an expert pilot. Wait, sorry, sorry. What, what's the difference between pilot and surrogate So pilot, pilot? The, the user is the pilot. The AI is the, is the co-pilot, right. providing you a system. Now, we want to be able to, you know, testing this with humans is expensive. So what we did is we, we came up with surrogate humans for some of our evaluations, where we took an expert policy and we made it worse. And what we did is we would... Um, We'd flip a coin, and we'd, if the coin came up heads, we'd flip, we'd execute a random action instead of act under the policy. Or we'd have what's called a laggy policy, which is basically emulating the fact that people are, can't act as quickly as maybe the, the, this, the, this, this agent. So an action would get repeated with some likelihood, I think we use 0.85. Um, again, this is what consistent with what other people have done is for surrogate pilots. So we did this. But the training was for real units, not surrogate units. Sorry? The training was with real humans rather than circuit humans? The training was, we, we did both. We okay. trained with a, with a pilot that was imitating humans okay. as well as surrogate pilots. And that's what this table shows, actually. So what we have here is, um, let me see. They, these are our pilots. So this is a human pilot, our policy that's meant to imitate humans. This is this noisy pilot with likelihood, I don't remember, 0.8. It executes a random action. Thrusting, you're controlling the thrust on this lunar lander. This is a laggy pilot, so with probability 0.85, I think it was, it's just going to execute the same action as before. With probability 0.5, it's going to call the policies, give it a new action. And we tried this with co-pilots, with, well, with no co-pilot, with a co-pilot that was trained with a laggy pilot, a co-pilot was trained with a noisy pilot, and a co-pilot that was trained with an imitation pilot. So when you, chain, when you train this co-pilot, this co-pilot needs to see different states and, act, and input actions. So when we train it, something needs to provide those input actions, whether it's maybe a human, but that's too, it's too sample and efficient for that. So we have a surrogate for that. But we have, we, and we tried three different surrogates. Does that make sense? Okay. So what we find is that, again, for these tasks, it said this is a difficult task. So this is success rate at landing. So the laggy pilot without assistance, again, it wasn't horrible. You know, it lands about 40% of the time, but it cr also crashes about, it's not, when it's not landing, it's crashing a okay, 10 minutes, okay? Um, imitation pilot is, you know, so people are really bad at this. At least I'm bad at this. Most of the people that we collect data on were bad at this. So actually, the imitation pilot crashes pretty regularly, very rarely lands. So imitation by the guy, that's an actual human, or that's like a... That's a pilot like, trained to imitate humans. So we had Chip and a few other people play the game 100 times or so, and then we trained a policy to imitate them. We just did behavioral cloning. Okay. Um, I'm just curious, is it cloning something? Or is there, uh, was Chip so bad? It was actually all right. It was probably me that was so bad. Okay, so but does it do... So I mean, is the, the training data a success rate? I mean, when you actually train it, do you also have such a small success rate? And training like data was pretty low. I don't remember the numbers. Like you really crash the thing all the time when you train it. Uh, uh, yeah, I think so. I don't remember exactly. It's been a little okay. while. It's, it's hard. Yeah, yeah, I'm not like... Uh, it's hard. Okay. Uh, anyway, so we did... These are the numbers that we get. Okay, no, I'm running low on time. We did this for other domains. Uh, and so we did it. We took human... We, I think, with several people from TTIC, probably many of you, played this game, and we would rent, We would give you a co-pilot. The co-pilot might be a placebo, so there is no co-pilot. You're playing it yourself, or our co-pilot. We wouldn't tell you which was which. And we found that... Yeah, here we go. So when, you're, when, when people at TTIC play this game, this is crashing. So they were crashing that about... Yeah, so that answers <laughs> your question. So we're, you know, maybe it's just people at TTIC or, or what? This is a hard game. Um, and these are showing their trajectories. Again, this is showing a fixed flag. Really, the flag moved around. So when people played it, this is where they went. Red is crash, so no green here. And then this is with our co-pilot. Um, again, now when they're playing with our co-pilot, they're about you know ninety percent success rate. Why does only the co-pilot have timeouts? Is that just the co-pilot? I think people crashed before they timed out. <laughs> so at least something is good. So again, with, <laughs> again with this, going off screen counts as a crash. So they may have flown off the screen. And again, I'll, I'll just play this video and then I'm going to skip ahead to. This is just showing side by side with on the left and without assistance. That's a crash. 
It's a hard, it's really hard. So you get the idea. Crash, 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 crash. Almost, almost, yeah. That actually, that's good. <laughs> um, so anyway, now, so this, this is, this, this is, and again, we did a whole user study where he asked people on how comfortable or how responsive it was, how faithful, how consistent, da, 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 da. It's all in the paper. Um, we did this for the reaching task, similar results. People are a little bit better at reaching because it's not interacting with the ground. Okay. So again, I'm going to skip through this for the sake of time. But there are problems with this, right? So the co-pilot that we have is very dependent on the pilot that it was trained on. So if, and so if we have a laggy pilot, so this is a pilot that, again, repeats its actions, and we trained it with a co-pilot for a laggy pilot, the success rate was 6%, really, really low. The noise, one trained for a noisy pilot did better, uh, but not for an imitation pilot. For the drone reacher, so this is a six-doff drone flying task. It actually was not good with this, this pilot that's meant to emulate people. Um, but at the same time, the laggy pilot, well, actually, you know, didn't crash. It didn't wasn't successful at reaching the goal, but it also didn't crash. Um, the imitation pilot was actually uh, these these co-pilots were actually pretty good in terms of not crashing. But were not good in reaching. So you get this behavior that depends on the pilot that you're playing with and how the co-pilot was trained. And again, does require some knowledge of the task and that we don't want to crash. Let's see, let's see what happens if you just trained on all three, you know, the mixture of all three? I think we did that. Um, I don't remember what the numbers were, but I think we tried that at some point. Yeah. That would presumably help. Yeah, right? does that, well, because of the set, just dominate. Everything. Yeah, I'm not, I'm not sure. I, I would imagine it, it would because I, I, I suspect that what we're seeing is there are just parts of the state space that the co pilot did not see during exactly. training that we're exposing right, to. Thinking, just and all so if you did that, that would help. So many, yeah. Much, many, yeah. Uh, okay, so we have very you know, recent work. In fact, this is, this is Lucha and Takuma. Lucha is here. Takuma, I think, is downstairs. There's a deadline today, so that's what they're working on. So to do this via what we call generative guidance. Basically, long story short, it's a diffusion model. So now, we don't want to have any knowledge of the task, so no reward, no general reward. The goal space is not defined. It could be continuous, it could be discrete. We don't know what it is. We just assume that there are some set of tasks that the user might want to do. They might want to fly around, they might want to land, they might want to go to a region, they might want to just hover there and flow to loop-de-loops. We don't know what it is. But we assume that what we do have is we have access to trajectories representative of the desired behavior. Here's how some people would want to play with this, play this game or do this task. And so now if we knew then the distribution, the, desi uh, the desired distribution over actions, the question is could we use that to assist the pilot? But then the question is we don't know what this desired distribution is. Where do we get it? And so for this we use diffusion models, and I know I'm, I'm very low on time, so, huh? Three minutes. Three minutes. I'm really low on time, so I'll skip. But um, we have a fourth one for this. Huh? One. We have a fourth minute. For okay. This. We're using DDPM for this. The basic, the basic gist of it is you have you want to you want to be able to sample from some distribution that you don't know. So how do you train this? You take in this case, case it's an image, whatever that's what you want to generate. That's x naught. You do you you use forward diffusion. So you basically gradually add noise until you get a Gaussian distribution. And then you train a model that denoises that. And then what that's going to do is it's going to generate a sample from your distribution. So it's a very effective way of sampling from an unknown distribution. And that's what we're doing here. And again, I'll skip all this because I'm training, but uh, I'm low on time. Huh? Thank God. <laughs> exactly. But it's very, very simple, right? This, 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 is, again, this is from the whole um, yeah. well, paper. Again, you know, at least in algorithm form, it's a very, very simple to, sam to sample from. Um, okay, but for shared autonomy, we don't want to we don't want to generate a random face, right? Or we don't want to generate a random action or you know, a trajectory that might be to land because maybe the person wanted to fly around, they didn't want to land. So we don't want to do full diffusion. So what they're showing here is this diffusion ratio. So one typical you know diffusion is nominally over here. I'm completely the reverse process is taking something from a Gaussian and fully denoising it. And that's going to give me a face, or it's going to give me a valid trajectory. So it's going to conform to the data distribution, but it's not going to be what the user wants, or may not be what the user wants. Over to the left is no diffusion, basically. That's just do it, do it, execute the user's action. 
That is highly, it's high fidelity, yeah? Sorry, just remember, you're adding noise to the action, not to the state? This is the action. Um, so then, that, that, can, that matches what the user wants, but it's probably not going to be good at the task because these people are not good at playing this game or performing this task. So really what we want is we want to be somewhere in between, like partial diffusion, where we get the benefits of maybe somewhat matching the data distribution, but also adhere to the, and it's very, very hand wavy, right? Like this idea of partial diffusion. Uh, and here's a pictorial view of this. So here's some initial distribution that we have here. We're going to forward diffuse, so just add noise. Add noise, this might be a distribution over actions. Add noise, we get our Gaussian. I wanted to give you another two minutes, but uh, I think uh, you're left at the center. <laughs> this could happen. This could be a good talk to um, And then there's the forward diffusion. Basically, we have the switching time. This is only go so far and then come back, right? And, we, you know, we're not the first people to think about this. We found this paper from Erman and others, um, SDE edit or SD edit, I don't remember which. The basic idea is you want to take some sketch of an image and turn it into an actual image. Right? So that's the basic idea. You have some distribution over strokes, distribution over images. That's the um, green. Here is the image that you're generating. So you're going to gradually add noise, and then this is what you're generating, this blue circle. And then it's eventually going to be representative of a true image, but hopefully adhere to the user's uh, um, intent. Right? And so they do this. They do exactly this for images, and they show that, well, if I have a forward diffusion ratio of zero, I get the sketch, not surprisingly. If I have it one, I get a realistic image. But for high values of T naught, we call it K, the images you get are realistic, but they don't match the user's sketch. So you want to be, in fact, they coin, though they have it here, they call it the sweet spot. So that's where you want to be somewhere in between. And just this is zooming in, showing the effect. Right? So again, nothing looks like, I mean, there's a bed, I guess, but it looks very different from the sketch. And so this is what we do. Again, there's, there's this nice, uh, you can show that you can actually bound, depending on how far you do forward diffusion, how far you are from the user's action. So that gives us some sense of how much are we changing their action. OK, and again, I'm, I'm way over time. So we do this for a lunar lander. We collect data. This is actually a lunar reacher. To collect the data set, um, we use this, again, to train our diffusion model. We evaluate this on, again, many of the same domains that we saw before. We're showing this very quickly. Baseline policies. Again, we don't know what the policy is. We don't know the reward. We don't need to train with those policies. We're just doing the diffusion with them. If we have this ratio of 0.4, we get significantly improved, so this is this is success rate. So this is a hard task. At least our at least our baseline policies are pretty bad at it. They crash almost all the time. Now they're much better with with our shared autonomy. They become maybe even better. Well, this is success rate. This is success rate at landing. I should say, if I go to full diffusion, they're actually worse. Why is that? Because the the goal location is shifting. The co-pilot doesn't know where the goal is. So that's why, actually, it's, it's less successful if we go to full diffusion. The user wants to land here, but the co-pilot the co doesn't know where it is. And the co-pilot, with full diffusion, might try to land here, because that's where it's landed before. And it ends up crashing. And that's actually why you see that the crash rate goes up slightly. And you know, interesting thing about this is that we try this with a variety of different noise levels and laggy levels. So what we're showing here, again, sort of is that cartoon plot that I had before. Blue is success rate. This is the forward diffusion ratio. So zero is no shared autonomy. One is full diffusion. And we see if you look at, let's pick something, let's pick this one here, for example. The user is, with this is a noise setting of 0.3, 20% success rate. As the diffusion ratio goes to 0.3, it maxes out at about 75, and then it goes down. Um, the crash rate initially for some reason goes up, then it goes down and you get this floating behavior, which basically means the assistant didn't know, what doesn't know what the goal is, so it bounces around between goals, and it might crash as a result of that. But anyway, what I, my point is that if you look at this, for all these different pilots, ranging from a noise, like flip a coin, I'm going to execute a random action with, with likelihood 0.1 versus 0.8, the peak performance is about the same, 0.3 to 0.4. So it's fairly robust to the different pilots. In terms of performance. 
And then we do this for block pushing. We find this, you know, very similar thing, maybe a little bit, no, but the same thing here, and I'm out of time. Okay. So, again, now what I was going to talk about is another project with Takuma, Chung, and, and with Greg, where we want to actually not push blocks, but we actually want to stack them. And I'm just showing this because I found this block uh, version of this data center that was in some paper. Isn't the real stuff. Yeah, it, yeah, it is. And someone built it out of blocks. Uh, but again, we're using diffusion models to uh, reason over the stability of an object. So if I put that object down, is the place where I'm going to place it stable or not? And so we want to be able to generate stable posts of objects. Okay. Huh? <laughs> What's that? You're out of time. Yeah, no, I'm done. I'm done. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Okay. Any questions? Okay. Questions? So actually, so the, this is in some sense this is something that is in standard control. You know, like you know, if uh, cars or park or whatever, when you want to go right, you can think of it as an optimal control problem. With like, you know, what do I? Um, how do I? You know, take the joystick as I want to go right, and now mm -hmm. what's the optimal policy mm -hmm. to go right? Right. So mm -hmm. this and, and this has. So with this approach seems rather different. I'm just curious if. Uh, you can apply standard uh, control methodology here, or yeah, I don't mean like for DJI, for example. If, you, if you've flown a you know a drone ten years ago, they were very difficult to fly, very unstable. DJI has a fair bit of you know intelligence on board to make sure that the resulting is stable. I don't I don't know what they're doing. Um, you know, loosely speaking, you could sort of think of what we have as a, a constraint on crashing or. Rotational acceleration. Well, it's um, much more local, right? Because what I think the big difference versus that, is what you're doing, is they're taking this shift the joystick to the right mm -hmm. as like a, a, the the reward function for the control. If you want to think of it this mm -hmm. way, or yeah, it's not reward because yep. it's not, right, mm -hmm. they they now have a there's a local uh, control problem of yep. uh, how do I make the 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 drone or whatever stable and go to the yep. right, right? Yep. So that's a yep. well defined yep. control problem. Yep. Now you have the control button for right, for up, for left, or whatever. Mm -hmm. and, and I think that's the approach you're right with. Is this is a more of a global approach. Yeah, I mean, there, there is some local reasoning over the states as well. Like, you know, so that reward general has some constraints on acceleration. Um, but it's more general in, this, in the sense, if you, if you mean general, like spatially general. Yes. They're also, yeah, so there's notion of how close you are to the ground and right. things like that. So you're taking well. that into account here, which is not a, thing, a yes. traditional. As far as I know, it's not. They might have some altitude. I mean, they have altitude information, so they might include that, but I, I doubt it. Is it possible for like the agent to infer like some some reward, which is like a function of how happy the user is of actual progress? Yeah. Like, if for example, if the user like moves their choice stick like super like jerkily, <laughs> that means they might not be happy. Yeah, that's true. I guess you could imagine doing something like that. Like if you keep doing it over and over again, that might have suggest a sweat detector on the joystick. I don't like what you're doing. Um, yeah, I, we're not using that, or at least not explicitly, and I'm sure not even implicitly. Just have a camera on the user's yeah. face. Yeah, you could feed that yeah. back in. Or just like, have like, a bit of audio and allow you to shout, like, not that. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> or good. Like that. <laughs> yeah, you could. Yeah. It's a language. Yeah, with mean, one of the diagrams, I used to have a little speech bubble. Because that was part of actually for the, for the underwater environment. What we wanted is that you know the input is a joystick and an image, but there are no objects there. It's not like there's a cup here and a bowl there. It's just rocks everywhere. So even from joystick input itself, it's difficult to infer what the user wants. But if they could describe it, that provides an, an auxiliary signal. So in fact, I mean here, and these are interesting questions because there's both like getting rid, getting richer signal from the user, like mm -hmm. more than just what they would use if they're directly controlling yep. it. But I'm wondering if you could also benefit from having uh, any type of communication from the co-pilot to the pilot, like from the computer back to the user, which if I understand correctly, you have absolutely no, like the only communication from the computer to the user is through what the robot actually yeah, does, correct. right? Correct. Uh, but if the if, if that can benefit, right, if mm -hmm. you can indicate what, where it's not sure of or where yeah. it thinks the goal is, right? Yeah, you no, that, that would be valid, yeah, would be useful. Any other questions? Okay, so uh, next week we have uh, Sasha Rosborough telling us about uh, neural networks. And, oh, yes. Finally, something. <laughs>
She's been working on it since the 80s, I think, just under different names. So uh, yes, yeah, so I spoke about it last year. <laughs> <laughs> so it's just exactly. the same. Okay, thanks. <laughs> So you're taking well, that into account here, which is not a yes. traditional... As far as I know, it's not. They might have some altitude. I mean, they have altitude information, so they might include that, but I, I doubt it. Is it possible for, like, the agent to infer... Like some some reward, which is like a function of how happy the user is of the actual progress. Yeah. Like, if, for example, if the user like moves their joystick stick, like super like jerkily, <laughs> that means they might not be happy. Yeah, that's true. I guess you could imagine doing something like that. Like, if you keep doing it over and over again, that might suggest. Have a sweat detector on the joystick. That might suggest, <laughs> hey, you're doing something. I don't like what you're doing. Um, yeah, I, we're not using that, or at least not explicitly, and I'm sure not even implicitly. Just like have a camera on the user's yeah. face. Yeah, it could feed be. that yeah. back in. Or just like have like a bit of audio and allow you to shout like "not that" yeah. <laughs> <laughs> or "good" like that. <laughs> yeah, you could. Yeah. It's a language. Okay. Yeah, with one of the diagrams, I used to have a little speech bubble, but because that was part of actually for the un for the underwater environment, what we wanted is that you know the input is a joystick and an image, but there are no objects there. It's not like there's a cup here and a bowl there. It's just rocks everywhere. So even from joystick input itself, it's difficult to infer what the user wants. But if they could describe it, that provides an auxiliary signal. So in fact, I mean, here and these are interesting questions because there's both like getting rich, getting richer signal from the user, like more mm -hmm. than just what they would use if they're directly controlling yep. it. But I'm wondering if you could also benefit from having uh, any type of communication from the co-pilot to the pilot, like from the computer back mm -hmm. to the user. Which, if I understand correctly, have absolutely no. Like the only communication from the computer to the user is through what the robot actually yeah, does, correct. right? Correct. Uh, but if the if if that can benefit, right? Mm -hmm. If the computer can indicate where where it's not sure of or where it yeah. thinks is the goal is, right? Yeah, you no, can, that that would be valid. Yeah, would really be useful. Okay. Any other questions? Okay, so uh, next week we have uh, Sasha Rosgrove telling us about uh, neural networks. And, oh, yes. Yeah. Finally. <laughs> She's been working on it since the 80s, I think, just under different names. So it's not like, uh, yes, yeah, so, uh, I spoke about it last year. <laughs> <laughs> so it's just the same. Okay, thanks.